A very good morning to everyone. Uh, welcome to the session on blended learning, the new normal. My name is uh, Shantanu Paul. I'm the CEO and founder of Talent Sprint. Um, along with me, we have some great panelists today in the session. We have uh, Kala Anand from Priya University. We have, welcome Kala. Thank you. Hi, Shantanu. We have uh, Supreet Nagaraju from Adobe. Thank you. Hi, Shantanu. Hey, hey, Supreet. And we have Shauri Pratap Singh from Coursera. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Shantanu. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see all of you. And I guess my job is made remarkably easy by the great stalwarts I have on the panel this morning. So a warm welcome to all of you as well and to the audience that's watching this uh, event live uh, at this point in time. So with that, um, I just mentioned in my opening comments that um, you know blended learning is now the new normal. I think we all have accepted that. We learned the term new normal from the finance industry uh, back in 2007 when the global crisis happened and then the new normal of economics came after that. Um, I think we had another new normal um, that happened um, perhaps in 2016, December when demonetization happened. And that uh, in some sense, a very abrupt event of cash disappearing from the market led to an entire innovation in fintech and digital payments in this country. In a similar analogous form, I think COVID, while unintended and undesirable as a global event, uh, post-COVID, we are seeing a massive disruption and change, uh, hopefully, for the entirely new world of education and education technology that has happened. So I like to kind of conflate the two and say that what um, Demon did for fintech in India, uh, I believe COVID will do for edtech in India. And I think we are at the cusp of that uh, major event. And in some sense, the topic of blended learning is a significant subset of that bigger problem of edtech uh, across the country. And of course, uh, we're talking about blended learning in the context of higher education uh, today. So with that quick introduction, um, I'd like to you know, request my panelists to open their comments uh, with a few words about their views uh, and the way they see the world. I'd like each of you, starting with Kala, to say a few words about what you do in your respective roles in your current organization, maybe a few words on that. And then you can talk about your vision for the next few minutes on what you think blended learning means for the uh, coming days, years, and uh, decades. Kala, can I start with you, please? Sure. Thank you, Shantanu. And um, thank you, Fiki, and the team at the Telangana State um, Hired Council for putting this together. Uh, my name is Kala Anand. I'm <clears throat> the Director for Communications partnerships and career services at Korea University. Uh, we are technically a new university, um, about two years old, but uh, the sponsoring body, the IFMR Society, has been around for 50 years in education. So we, we are young, but with a very firm legacy, which makes this scenario very interesting uh, for us at this stage. And I think what I'd like to talk about today more broadly is um, one, of course, the, the NEP um, context that we're talking about. But while the theme for today is about blended learning and its place in the context of the NEP, I think they're both overshadowed, as Shantanu really put it, by the looming cloud of the ongoing health crisis, you know, which is something we cannot ignore. Hence, my narrative will be around the introductory of the, of the NEP and its focus on the online or blended learning. But primarily, it will be around the changing role and the future of higher education institutions or HEIs within the context of both the NEP and the new education future, if you like, which this pandemic has awakened us to. So we are faced with a significant challenge, but an equally significant opportunity as well. So NEP has undoubtedly placed a unique emphasis on the uh, online and the open distance learning, the ODL. And its push on online learning primarily, um, or blended learning, is to address access, equity, and inclusion issues to meet the, um, or to meet the SDG of the lifelong learning, or to bridge the gap of teacher education, or maybe also to accelerate this new learning and disruptive technologies or languages or vocational education. So the policy itself is ambitious in its vision to leverage technology to achieve the projected um, gross enrollment ratio. But I think it takes a very calculated approach in this. So the makers aim to focus on a few HEIs currently who have a robust online um, distance learning system to move them online and then test its efficacy as well as it seeks to roll out into the online movement through carefully designed um, part curricula, but appropriately scaled and tested in small pilot groups. Now, at a helicopter view, the NEP clearly encourages a paradigm shift um, in higher education, and to me, in two significant ways, while there are many other broader takeaways. It puts the learner at the center of the education universe, and it paves a way for a flexible credit or a choice-based credit system for a student. 
Now, both of this significantly challenge the historical higher education administration in our country, you know, which has been built on the foundations of rigidity, where a curriculum is mandated, and there is little room for educators to flex their arms to try anything different, leave alone the student trying. So things like choice and flexibility isn't really part of the higher education language in this country so far. So in that context, the term um, digital pedagogy, if you like to put that, is new, it's experimental, it's futuristic, and forces the HEIs across the country into a new domain of knowledge, uh, which they now have, uh, have to warm up to. Uh, so Shantanu, I wasn't too sure if you wanted me to go with my full spiel or just introduction, but uh, um, I'm happy to yeah. go proceed yeah. to talk through as well. No, uh, that's a good start, Kala. I think you've already seeded the discussion with some important points, learner centricity, choice based credit, uh, digital pedagogy. So we will move to the other speakers and I'm sure we'll open up a lot of questions as we go forward. So thank you for the introduction, uh, introductory comments from you, Kala. I'd like to go now to Shore Pratap to talk about uh, the Coursera experience. And uh, I know you've worked in uh, companies like LinkedIn and Monster. So I guess you know professional education is perhaps in your blood at this point, at least professionally speaking. So could you please share your thoughts on what uh, the uh, you know the new education policy means to you and what this whole digitalization of education means to you? Sure. Thank you, Shantanu. So just as a quick introduction, I'm the regional director at Coursera and I lead our India business. So two lines of uh, business, Coursera for business and Coursera for campus roll up to me. And, uh, you know, I, I can bring in perspectives from the industry. So many of you might have already used our platform. And just as an introduction to Coursera, we're the world's leading online education company that brings together, you know, content from 200 top notch universities and industry educators like Duke, Yale, Michigan, uh, ISP, uh, IIM Calcutta, Google, IBM, Amazon, et cetera, to offer thousands of courses, specializations, certificates, and even online degrees to adult learners across the world. Uh, we also partner with more than 2,500 companies. Uh, and, to, and you know these companies use us to upskill and reskill their employees to achieve their business objectives. Um, you know, on this particular panel, I'd like to bring in a perspective from how you know the, the world of jobs and skills is changing so rapidly. And to anchor some of my thoughts, I'd like to point towards some recent research. Uh, according to Deloitte, you know, 42% of jobs are expected to have an entirely different skill set by 2022. And that's just about a couple of years from now. Uh, International Labor Organization predicts that about 44 crore jobs are at a risk of, uh, you know, uh, are at risk as a result of the economic impact of COVID-19. And many of these jobs are in India. And generally, we have also heard uh, in various surveys that you know about 50% of employers think that universities do not fully prepare the students to join the workforce. And given the above, I believe that the students <clears throat> graduating uh, in this year and in the near future will be entering one of the toughest job markets, and possibly it could be worse in 2008 and 9 as well. Um, and enabling students with job relevant skills will be even more critical than ever. And uh, as we all have acknowledged at different points of time, the traditional university ecosystem in its current form was not prepared to solve for this massive scale and quality of education required. And in that context, I think the new education policy is a very, very refreshing step and positive uh, uh, step in, in, a, in looking at the long term future. And things that I like about uh, the NEP is uh, uh, it's forward looking. Uh, it, like Kala said, you know, it offers greater flexibility to students in higher education. Uh, with multiple entry and exit points, relaxed choice-based credit systems, greater autonomy to innovate on curriculum, et cetera. <clears throat> and uh, uh, most importantly, focus on multidisciplinary education. Uh, and like Kala mentioned, you know, the student is at the center of the uh, overall uh, design. And those are a few things which I really love about the NEP. Yeah, Great. thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we'll get another round, if required, to elaborate some points that others might have. So we'll. Come back to some of you again, but for now we keep moving forward. So thank you for that. I think the job relevance in a tough job market is a very important point to make because I think even without COVID, even without digitalization, higher ed in India was already at, at, at a some of a semi crisis for quite some time, maybe a last decade, saying that how do we create uh, attractive aspirational job options for large numbers of people? Uh, I, I believe country has close to 10 million graduates every year. So, so by that logic, I mean, we already had the, we had a big problem already. Now we have another big problem, which is how to digitalize the delivery of the system itself, while not uh, forgetting the fact that the primary outcome of all education and higher ed has to create a high quality workforce and a high quality entrepreneurship and all of those other things. So those problems remain unsolved while we now have another unsolved problem in front of us, which is significant. 
which is the absence of physical contact. Uh, so with that, that's a great point, and I'm going to come back to this, I'm sure, multiple times in this conversation. So let me turn to Supreet. Uh, Supreet, you have, by virtue of your role as uh, head of education at Adobe, uh, been at the forefront of tool stacks, platforms, essentially uh, helping institutions get into a digital world uh, by way of technology. And I think that tech revolution that's sweeping the world today um, needs more companies providing great ed tech solutions and platforms. So your thoughts, please, on uh, how this new education policy, uh, how do you look at this, and, and what do you see is ahead for uh, the entire ed tech industry? Sure, Shantanu. Uh, firstly, uh, good morning, Telangana and the entire country. Uh, firstly, uh, thank you so much for FIKI and uh, the state of Telangana for this opportunity. Uh, uh, I lead the uh, education vertical for uh, Adobe in India, which is a traditional uh, school, college, and the university system and the education ministry as a project. One thing that we have always been uh, firmly believed in and uh, practiced is uh, Learning is not a spectator sport, you know, and truly we have the customer centricity when we have clear insights of what is the ulterior motive of every single denominator in the society and race to the ulterior motive of that. And digital and technology has always paved a way for that uh, as an area. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the health crisis uh, un under the current uh, COVID situation has forced a lot of people to look at it in a true uh, optics that needs a uh, completely different uh, approach to it. Uh, at Adobe, uh, we not just offer tools uh, as a service, most of you know us as uh, Photoshop or a PDF company, but uh, the true essence of it is we believe in delivering digital experiences uh, that reach uh, different people in, in different ways. Uh, and there are multiple bunch of learners, right? You know, if I were to look at the uh, NEP's policy, the fine granularity, uh, you know, fundamentally boils down to two or three aspects. Race to the ulterior motive of every individual, give them freedom, flexibility, and also bring in the student centricity, which was missing in a very, very big way in uh, the current ecosystem for the last uh, you know, few decades, I would say. And what does this give rise to? You know, If you were to just look at the last 90 days to 100 days of uh, you know, transformations that have happened in the world, 50 plus percent of jobs have just traditionally been done on the ground, have migrated to the online world, whether it is an IT job or it's a non-IT job or anything which probably has been traditionally digital in nature, which is a physical plus digital in nature, have moved to a 80-20 ratio in terms of digital plus physical. Now, what does it mean to education? It's a very clear indicator that you need to gear up from gear two to gear five in terms of being ready in terms of addressing every single learner. Some people are learners of text. Some people are learners you know, by voice. Some people are learners uh, specifically by uh, you know, animations or you know, visual expressions. Uh, and fundamentally, today, uh, as we look forward, and as Shaurya was also mentioning, the next three years would effectively mean that 50% of the jobs would move to a digital world. And there will be no physical interventions that will probably come into picture. Given that factor, it it boils down to two large areas. How do you transform education in a more meaningful way, which reaches all five, you know, uh, formats of education that we just described, you know, in, in different formats, voice, video, uh, you know, augmented realities and, and new technologies that are coming in. And that's where you know, I think the new policies of open distance learning and, you know, having a very clear cut borderless education that is being, uh, you know, uh, brought into the policy. The fundamental success of this would lie largely in how we implement it, because you know that's one of the uh, areas that's been a dip spot, you know, or, or or not been such a great area for education as an industry traditionally. So we've got to watch out for these, and I think we'll discuss more about this. La the second aspect of it is is to do with the vocationalization of education. You know, we need to understand that you know the gross enrollment ratio today is only limited to X number of universities, but the larger audience who probably are not even uh, part of the core ecosystem now get the opportunity to study at any place, anywhere, any any device, any moment, you know, irrespective of the uh, barriers that we had traditionally as an education ecosystem. With that, I'd like to, you know, uh, just highlight upon, uh, you know, the most important fundamentals that could probably change. Uh, a, uh, curriculum-based, uh, you know, revolutions that are going to be modern. You know, it's, it's no longer a tradition of tech only for techs. 
uh, or business only for business or humanities only for humanities. The amalgamation part of it is a big welcome. That's point one. Point two is the fact that uh, centricity, you know, what we call in business is customer centricity. The student centricity needs to come into place in a very, very big way. The third aspect of it is collaboration, whether it is foreign collaborations outside of India, whether it is industry academia collaboration, collaboration for measuring a particular learning outcomes become the name of the day. With that, I'd like to pause back to you, Shant. Thank you so much, Supreet. A lot of ground covered there. Uh, some of them will definitely make a comeback. The common pattern that's coming through in all of this is uh, this whole idea of learner centricity. And I think Kala got that going and everybody has been kind of building on it. So Kala, I'd like to give you a chance to elaborate on that, uh, to talk about uh, Kriya's vision, learner centricity. Um, and, and that would be a good uh, sort of uh, theme to evolve a little bit. Because I think, right, like you rightly pointed out in the beginning, I think one of the classic challenges we have in India historically you know, we come from a system where uh, the guru, the teacher is supreme and the learner is always subservient in some sense. And I think in some sense, if you look at the culture that has kind of pervaded even post-British education has not fundamentally altered that equation. So now in a learner centric world where the learner is the essentially, whether you call them the customer, whether you call them the learner, but they are the primary agent in, in this whole ecosystem. And, and around them, everybody is providing a set of uh, offering services, capabilities. And the instructor is one more such great uh, source of capabilities that you can imbibe from, right? So that's, in a, in a sense, the new architecture of learning globally, and of course, in this NEP as well. So if you could talk about uh, starting a new university, brand new, new age concept like Kriya, which will probably count in 30 years from now, count as among the premier uh, great outcomes of new, new age universities. What is your vision of learner centricity and how will it be different from what you've seen in the past from universities? Yeah, thank you. I think, uh, yeah, so at one angle, being the new university, as I've often said, is um, we found it easy enough to pivot uh, from where we are um, to the NEP and as well as to the COVID, right? Um, so clearly, uh, very quickly, we we started to have a CIO or CTO join the vice chancellor cabinet meeting. So it this was, you know, IT was always sitting in the periphery of, uh, you know, this password doesn't work situation to now be bringing uh, a tech uh, person into the mainframe of uh, curriculum discussion, if you like. So which which has really happened, which is which is uh, which wasn't something before. And I think for us as an institution, uh, we had a, a CTO function right at the start of when we actually set up the university. So it wasn't uh, sitting separate to the core of the leadership. Uh, we also had, I think to a great extent, uh, a media lab, uh, which is about uh, creating digital repository of content um, as well, which, uh, which was part of the university right when it was set up. So those two things, I think, uh, were in, in a way quite perceptive in the way we looked at uh, uh, learner centricity. And to me, the, the, the impact of what's happened now, I think this whole gate, uh, I kind of look at this uh, impact of COVID or NEP touching on five major impacts, and I'll touch on two with, with the learner centricity. One is the impact on the new learning, right? So one is you've got to... Um, draw up a curriculum in terms of what constitutes learning so you don't you have to create this healthy balance of synchronous and asynchronous learning environments uh, but you have to also customize uh, learning outcomes so we get into groups talking about um, how do you encourage a sen sense of self-learning how do you measure the learning how do you uh, you know, optimize on the flipped uh, technology. And these are some of those questions we, we keep asking. And our measures of learning um, have been constituted very differently right from the start of uh, when the university sat in. So which for us has put us in a, in a very uh, decent advantage. We are probably, again, one of those universities that has a center of pedagogy right when we started. Um, so you had a center of uh, pedagogy, which actually looked at uh, various learning systems around the world, looked at best practices and uh, started to look at some of these aspects of how do you measure learning and uh, going forward. So to a great extent, I think um, the, the fun fact, if you like, is that qualification may not equal learning. Right. Uh, and hence, the investment in learning pedagogy is probably going to be a must. Now, coming to quickly on the teachers bit, I think uh, while uh, some aspects around uh, 
you know, online learning can be kind of uh, sound very disorganized, right? So the learn from home systems are not really as disciplined um, as classroom. Uh, or, you know, if you go into blended, it's really not the same quality, if you like, uh, kind of uh, perception. But in fact, we are seeing it's bringing a whole new discipline because now you have shorter attention spans. Uh, you don't have a physically con uh, connected environment. So our teachers have to be more prepared and hence i think their role in the digital classroom to some extent is not teachers but more learning facilitators so what we have been doing is actually uh, bringing focus group discussions we've you know recently brought in one of the uh, trainers um, from the us to sit around pedagogy with us and to look at how do you ensure within the time that you have uh, you're able to creatively engage with the student and, and at the same time deliver a curriculum. At the same time, you're able to measure the learning effectiveness as well. So um, again, as I say, the fun fact that hybrid education uh, model is here to stay. So it's high time that teachers now look at uh, themselves as learning facilitators and not just a one-way delivery. I I'll, I'll stop there with those two, in fact. No, but Kala, those are outstanding points. In fact, uh, I will come back to the whole issue of uh, instructors and instructor instruction, you know, how to kind of adopt to this new world, right? Uh, because that's a major, I think, a challenge to overcome. Uh, and like you said, those are uh, really important the theme there. But I want to actually use some of your points also to uh, check with Supreet because he deals with lots and lots of institutions on a regular basis, perhaps multiples of thousands across the country. And Adobe would do the mo more, more than that across the world. Um, this point about the CTO becoming an integral part of the vice chancellor's cabinet, you know, perhaps the seat has moved from outside the room into next the next chair next to the VC, thanks to this. I mean, is that something that you're seeing um, across the board? That's one question. And an additional question you might also respond to is this whole idea of pedagogical innovation, right? I think uh, since the days of uh, when we read, uh, you know, Salman Khan, Khan Academy, the first book he wrote about the book that's called One School, One School, One World Schoolhouse. That's a fantastic book that talks about flipped classroom. And I think digital can actually make flipped classroom so much better. And the whole learning process can be so much more enriched for the student because they can have a pre-class, in-class, post-class experience, which today physical world is only an in-class experience. So are you seeing uh, on one side the elevation of the CTO into the key position decision maker? And are you seeing a genuine understanding of the fact that digital education can give us a lot more as an instructor and a learner? Uh, than historical systems were capable of extracting from the resources they had. Yeah. So, uh, Shantanu, uh, first things first. Uh, uh, yes, uh, there has been a shift in the overall uh, position of, uh, I would say, a professor or a dean of academics amalgamating the role of a CTO slash CDO at this stage. And, and that is the way I would like to frame this. Uh, you know, design is first becoming the uh, core of the entire activity. Uh, and then comes the technology aspect of it to bridge the gap as a super express highway from X to Y, uh, you know, from where they are to where they need to travel to. Now, is technology for the heck of technology being uh, discussed? Yes, in many places in, in India, there are still, uh, you know, universities who are just uh, doing the me too approach in terms of technology, you know. It, it could be another web, web conferencing system that they're trying to bring into picture without getting into the learning analytics aspect of it. The fundamental of any business, including education, falls back to one uh, you know critical aspect of it. Are your learners liking, enjoying, passionate about what they're doing? And are they learning from the expert? Maybe the uh, professional is an expert in, in delivering uh, what they have, uh, but are they delivering it in a meaningful way that is getting absorbed by the entire cross section of the class or the lowest bottom denominator in society. So that is where uh, you know we are seeing a sea of a change uh, in the last 30 days. You know, if I were to take the last six months as a uh, you know test bed or a uh, you know a data points that I were to evaluate, the first two months, you know, starting in March April time frame, uh, we saw just a knee jerk reaction of people just coming on board and saying that you know, hey, uh, I just want to switch on to a Zoom slash you know any other. Uh, web conferencing uh, facility uh, and then they slowly started realizing that you know hey uh, it's no longer going to work because you know students are just going to drop off and, and stuff like that then came an area where you know can we build meaningful interactive content which can actually resonate with every student as an area so then came the third angle of analytics you know what works for whom at where at what point in time can we have asynchronous learning as an, as an area 
Now, this was a juncture where I saw a, a whole host of institutions, both within India, in SARC countries, and other parts of the world, uh, looking at bringing the uh, design expert from both from pedagogy and technology uh, standpoint into the boardroom conversations. And that is when the serious discussions about technology aided or design technology aided learning with analytics came into picture. And then that's continuing. Uh, have they reached uh, you know the optimal mark? Answer is no. There, there is a long way to go. And have, are they collaborating with the experts? In some bits and parts, yes. Uh, but there is a lot of scope for learning from the experts in the industry uh, in terms of how they could learn. Because corporate learning has been there for ages. And, and they have been doing this in terms of asynchronous learning and learning analytics. The second aspect of your question specifically uh, in terms of how are we looking at the flipped learning uh, and, and are the, has there been a real uh, implications to the uh, you know, ground up? Uh, fundamental uh, statistic that India has faced, 80% of the students do not have an access to a true blue uh, technology-based learning system, technology-enabled learning system, let me put it that way. Uh, that's the first aspect of it. Second aspect of it is the fact that 90% of the faculties in higher education slash vocational education today are not enabled or empowered enough to sit in front of a live screen or even an offline and asynchronous model to deliver a specific learning model as, as an area. Uh, because it's two different ball games. You know, you, you need to understand how students are going to accept this as an area. And it, it, it needs a little bit of handholding. It needs a little bit of unlearning and relearning as an area, even for people like us who've been delivering, uh, you know, these formats of online uh, delivery mechanisms. Third aspect of it is action and reaction are equal and opposite. And that is not coming out clear and loud in most of the educational delivery mechanisms through technology-led areas. It's, it's usually still... Uh, you know, going back to the physical world where there is a one-way street, but you're just aping what was happening in the physical world to an online world. So there's a necessity for a real-time brainstorming and a clear-cut execution plan in terms of how they could transition because technology today enables everything. There's absolutely no bounds to it. And last but not the least, put the student at the center of it. Market yourself as a, a talent hub. Showcase your strengths, um, you know, and weaknesses because there's obviously uh, people would love to look at it because you're going to rub shoulders with the best of the best, irrespective of the fact whether you're in a regulated education market or not. And that's that's where I would like to pause. Yeah. Great, thank you so much, Supreet. So, Shaurya, the question of uh, vocal, uh, vocationalization of education and the idea that uh, you you made the point in your opening comments, which I think uh, you know is a pretty striking comment. Uh, that uh, people are in some sense aware of, but it's always worth repeating, is that the world is getting harder for jobs. And in some sense, the bar for recruitment of entry-level talent is just going up, not just entry-level, but lateral as well. But uh, in higher education, the primary focus is to get people their first jobs, right? So, so if you look at that world that is evolving, in some sense, the bar keeps getting higher in terms of what companies expect. You know, what five years ago was acceptable for getting to a good company is no longer acceptable. It's below the bar, right? So I'd like for you to tell us uh, what are the top four or five things you're seeing from a Coursera perspective that uh, what are the five skill sets, whether they're technical skill sets or uh, soft skill sets or domain or whatever that might be. What are the top few five, four or five skill sets you see that uh, are really something that makes somebody truly employable in the new era? And this might be deep tech. It might be other skills. But just love your thoughts because you probably have access to data that we don't. Sure, absolutely, Shantanu. So I guess uh, to your you know to your statement that you know universities so far have actually thought of themselves as helping students get their first job. I think in the coming years that's going to fundamentally change because a lot of existing professionals will also need constant reskilling and upskilling. Uh, the shelf life of uh, skill is now being reduced to about five years. That of a technical skill is uh, getting to about two years. So it's almost like, you know, if you're an engineer, by the time you're getting into your engineering degree and you come out, uh, the world has changed for you, right? And lifelong learning is going to be one of the first key skills, I would say, uh, over and above any kind of uh, technology skill that should be, that will be very, very critical for career success for students. Uh, the other thing I would like to, you know, call out is that, uh, you know, Coursera, when this pandemic, uh, you know, uh, came about and hit all of us, what we did was uh, with the intention of helping universities uh, maintain continuity of education on their campus, Coursera actually launched a corona, coronavirus response initiative across the globe where we invited all universities across the globe 
you know, who were impacted by coronavirus to use Coursera for campus catalog free uh, for up to 5,000, 10,000 students. And we enabled this. this. This initiative is still on until 30th of September. Uh, and there are tons of learnings that we've had during this time. So, you know, first of all, just in terms of uh, how do you create impact with the students? I think uh, both Kala and Supit spoke about uh, the learner experience. I'd say, you know, what I'm reflecting on is, you know, first of all, we need to understand the motivation for learning itself, right? So some students will come in uh, wanting to learn skills which will help them with employability, but some others will also want some sort of personal enrichment, right? And both are important for long-term career success and life success. So once you, uh, and, and you need to be enabled, you, you need to be able to facilitate both kinds of learning on the platform. Then of course, is the quality of content that you bring in, uh, the flexibility that you offer to the learner, whether it is self-paced and, and the relevance of that particular curriculum to their eventual goal that they have set out. At the same time, I would also say that we cannot completely rule out the faculty experience as well, because, you know, Without uh, getting on, getting the faculty on board, this blended learning model cannot be successful. And I know enough has been said about uh, how online learning can actually solve much of this. But unless we also handhold the faculty and bring them up to speed, it's not going to work. And I think there are certain benefits of these online platforms for the faculty members themselves because it creates a feedback loop because there's tons of analytics which is available when your learners are learning on these platforms. And it really allows you to deep dive as to what are the areas that you need to focus on versus the technology piece. My own personal example, you know, uh, during my MBA days was that I was an engineer, got into a, a MBA class, and I had people who had done their, you know, CAs and BCom honors and whatnot, and they all came in and also attended the same finance lectures. So, you know, I thought that the finance lectures were moving too fast for me, uh, and I thought that the technology lectures, you know, where they teach you concepts like data structures, etc., they were moving too slow for me. And I think those are some of the areas where, where online can plug in the gap, where with the flipped classroom approach, you can possibly bring students up to speed and then bring them to the same level before you get here, before the faculty member starts to actually accelerate it. Uh, to your question about uh, you know, the skills, uh, I think broadly we categorize uh, you know, three different domains which are super critical today. So irrespective of the role and you know, your function or your industry, you will need business, technology, and data skills to be successful in your careers. Now, if you're a data scientist, you will obviously need expert level proficiencies on data skills uh, and possibly less on business. But we definitely need some level of proficiency across this entire uh, paradigm, where if you're a business manager and you do not have understanding of basics of technology and you're not familiar with data, uh, data skills, then it's going to be a challenge for you to be successful in your respective roles. So. Uh, I would I would pause there and say you know see if I addressed uh, your question if I answered it correctly. No, fair enough. Absolutely, I think uh, those are uh, business data technology. I would have expected one more lateral, basically you know sort of cross functional, cross domain. Uh, even some knowledge of you know uh, subjects which are not science and technology would also help because I think in some sense that's one of the challenges we have always faced yeah. in a system. Yeah. And I'd say that that's the perspectives. Yeah, we call them human skills. So things like problem solving, critical thinking, sure. design sure. thinking, yeah. all of those yeah. will fit in. Yes. So I want to start now zooming in my questions to specific issues that uh, I think are very important for the success of this mission, which is ahead of us, which is digitalization of uh, education uh, and the new normal is here to stay. We all agree. And we see pockets of challenges. We see how students have some challenges, which is, you know, access. Technology uh, is historically has been a leveler. But technology can also be a major divider and polarizer because technology, a perfect example now in K-12 is that, you know, uh, the low cost public schools uh, or the low cost private schools and public schools are struggling because kids don't have the infra and the parents don't have the infra to buy a computer and a network. So their classes have stopped. Meanwhile, uh, your and my kids are probably happily attending their class online and they're opening up, a, you know, a Mac or a whatever and connected to a good broadband. Yes, not ideal. Everyone's suboptimal, but clearly the, those who have technology access and affluence are able to, you know, attend something that is continuous and no disruption as such. But on the other hand, that's not true for others. So right now we're in a polarizing world. So my question to you would be that the state of Telangana had to look at this problem and say, how do I create a homogeneous access infrastructure for students in higher education? Uh, obviously, you know, education institutions which are, you know, catering to a certain uh, level of society are going to find a way to do this. They won't have to worry about how to worry about uniform access. But what do you think is the answer? Is it that we have to start thinking about at a state level saying that every student in college, in a college, 
government college or other uh, low cost other models of colleges do they have to be given a laptop and a broadband connection as part of their uh, basic infra readiness because it's like giving people textbooks and uniforms right i mean this is like the new problem that we have to give them the same thing just to be able to participate in the system so what do you think about that problem how do we solve for fundamental access if i can uh, just come in from an institution perspective and i i leave the tech technology bit to uh, my colleagues here <clears throat> i think yes most definitely one of the glaring focuses has been the digital divide right and uh, and we are at the forefront of a mobile revolution and we can we've seen that there is a huge pressure on the broadband but um, and i can talk from a kriya example because uh, you know we have a close to 25% of our cohort of students who are on financial assistance so they come from extremely small uh, places uh, we uh, take students from foundation schools um, who show high potential so and uh, last year we had at least 10% uh, of those students who are first generation college goers in their family so you, we can imagine the kind of background some of these students come from so i think uh, one is i would not uh, equate effective uh, online learning to connectivity alone uh, you know to some extent i think there is infrastructure disparity between our cities and income disparity within them so there is unequal um, distribution of learning outcomes uh, which is quite clearly one should be cognizant about so social structures domestic issues lack of learning spaces gender biases uh, all of them are are an issue so it's not like you give a laptop and you can solve the problem you can't do that uh, now what do you do in a family which is got which has got six people living in a small house and how do you how do you sort the electricity issue then how do you sort the space to learn so it's it's about rethinking um, not just about the technology but also the social structure right so i think the government might have given some serious cognizance at the university level i can say that if it has to be that you ensure that every learner has the social and technology infrastructure so at kriya for instance what we do is we've got our office of student life um who interacts with the students uh, on an everyday basis keeping track with some of these learners in terms of how how they are doing right are they having connectivity issues and if this could be machines this is broadband this is tools and immediately you have an it team that's alerted to take in, and that's taken care of because you can't afford um to create to take this cohort together um you know earlier we used to have a certain bias which um where uh, we had teaching only to the high performers in a class you 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 kind of didn't address a lot of learning disabilities and today you've got the other so i think uh, if at all we need to solve this problem yes you can't um, afford to look at students as mere numbers or faces in a classroom but that they are individuals with varying learning challenges and i think uh, you can no longer ignore that which is why uh, the large universities with the massive numbers and however that is you can no longer um, ignore every learner and the infrastructure challenge uh, the societal challenge that each of them have um, and that's what we do at our university but um, happy to defer on to colleagues to comment how you support the technology element yes yeah, so 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 kala i think a point absolutely well taken but my limited point was that uh, you know the uh, the great can't be the enemy of the good right uh, we have to solve problems at at layers so would you agree that the technology infrastructure for students that itself is a problem that has to be solved first because that's relatively easy to solve it's a problem of money it's not absolutely. a problem of family structures and others which are i think might be more complex and higher order higher order problems to solve right absolutely and that's why i think the nep um, it has a mention of uh, bringing in philanthropy as part of the whole uh, system itself it's it's supporting higher education saying you can no longer be uh, curriculum or qualification delivering institutions you have to have academic support uh, so and hence it's it's it changes the whole role of an education institution Uh, and that uh, and that is why you not only have to be responsive you have to be responsible and and i think the nep is putting uh, that you can't just be agile uh, you also have to be sensitive so i think that is really what the balance the nep is putting and and i think from a leadership perspective at a higher education uh, that's the hat uh, we wear on uh, when we look at larger learning outcomes for sure yeah. uh, we can solve it with uh, with money uh, but there has to be good will and intent at at the policy level it's there but at the higher education level as well fair enough so in interest of time i'm going to move my questions forward uh, and then i won't have time to address the same question to everybody so bear with me on that one my next question is uh, the next stakeholder in the system we've talked about students kala addressed that let's talk about the universities and the colleges themselves right i mean if you look at their experience like you said supreet earlier and exactly my same experience i've had last 6 months uh, is you know since i offer a lot of technology solutions 
my company does to uh, universities you know the original thought was that how can we replicate a mirror copy of the physical classroom in a digital world and that's all i need to do because then everything else remains constant for me right but very quickly people realized that it's both impossible to create that and there are other great opportunities and upsides of using digital better so so now my question to you now is that most universities except for the very best don't have the quality technology leadership and strategic digital capabilities to build yeah. great platforms themselves so is there in your view a room for a, a sort of a common infrastructure that is on the cloud that can be shared by colleges and universities by tapping into it which is provides a virtual learning platform that people can use and i give you an example to make that point uh, many years ago the banking industry in india went through a transformation called core banking systems you might know this cbs became the big core banking technology came in and everybody started implementing core banking as a way of doing banking better all banks did the big banks found their own ways they could buy from oracle or uh, tcs or other solutions and they rolled out their core banking but then the cooperative banks which are all much smaller and relatively ill equipped to handle that level of technology couldn't solve this problem on their own so they all came together and formed an rbi set up a institution called iftas iftas which basically put out a core banking system on the cloud on a multi tenancy basis and allowed all the cooperative banks to share that infrastructure without having to build it so my question to you is do you think what we need to offer in telangana to all the universities and colleges is a shared cloud based you know digital delivery system which everybody can tap into without having to build it or architect it but they are good users of the system but not designers of the system is that do you think something like that will be needed at state levels or even national levels yeah so uh, absolutely uh, subscribe to what point you brought out uh, shantanu uh, you know if i were to just reflect back on adobe's overall performance in the last two quarters this is exactly what is happening in all industry verticals you know uh, what you refer to as core banking is now digital experience solutions you know some of the biggest banks including the traditional ones have switched over to uh, an online based cloud based systems uh, as an area and needless to say educational institutions over the world we have about 25000 plus universities and institutions who are with us uh, traveling through this journey Uh, Adobe was the first uh, and pioneers in the space of um, bringing application orientation. The first of it was the Creative Cloud, uh, which helps you on the design web and the video and AR VR technologies world to go completely on a cloud-based model. So, in the last 90 plus days, we've seen a tremendous spike in the way in which how institutions have been using these applications as an area. So, creativity is the name of the game. Needless to say, um, and and then majority of the institutions who run these kind of programs. are already drawing you know parlance for example the shristi school of art and design technology which is there in bangalore which is one of the pioneers in design space uh, the second area of it is with respect to the uh, technology space on learning mechanisms you know uh, traditionally people have switched over to video aspect of it but as salam was mentioning how do we uh, solve the problem of space how do you solve the problem of electricity So there are creative ways to solve this. You know, one of the uh, biggest solutions that I could think of today is the cloud-based learning management system, which is one of the biggest, uh, you know, uh, innovations that uh, majority of the corporate learnings have been using this for a long time. Adobe has been in this space for a long time as well, and we have an offering called as Captivate Prime uh, LMS, which is not any device, any place model with the low-cost bandwidth as an area. Now, from an equity standpoint, there are a lot of universities who subscribe to us at a institutional level we also have a consortium model for example you know uh, as an education ministry uh, let me take a live example an education ministry of let's say karnataka has, has recently subscribed to us uh, in in last november for something to do with creativity and and photoshop as an area so similar to that you know maybe telangana state can form a consortium of all the educational institutions higher ed autonomous universities and and we are more than happy to extend support in that way the third aspect of it is on the faculty aspect of it. right while you have the super express highways of technologies the six lane roads connecting all across like how we have our national highways and expressways uh, there is also a necessity for regulation of what needs to go out and how it needs to go out the faculty development aspect of it you know we now have uh, you know how do you deliver these online you know for example an in instructional design as a program along with the softwares for for faculties to use them from wherever whenever uh, kind of a model and last but not the least on how do you use them effectively from analytics and driving and pivoting the way in which you can deliver it for example you know as i was mentioning about if you have a family of four children or three children how do you effectively use them so that is where you know you know you you can 
killer makes it uh, from delivery and from stand. Last but not the least, uh, you know, uh, engagement. You know, one of the common threads that I've been seeing, engagement for institutions to measure success has always been proctored examinations. And I think there's a need for real at that model because when you switch over to the industry, there's no concept of proctoring. Just look at the results, right? There's nobody to sit and, you know, look at you, whether are you cheating, are you following the ethical way. It's important for institutions to relook at open book examinations. And, and this falls back to my MBA days when I used to study in, in IMB. And we never had any professor in any of our classrooms. And it, it, it used to be a learn and apply model. And with that, I think technology, uh, you know, creative way of addressing these delivery mechanisms would actually make a huge difference. Needless to say, uh, you know, it's important for all of you to collaborate uh, as a consortium. Uh, through the uh, ministry or even otherwise uh, as a uh, you know educational institutions consortium Okay. Shantan, if it's okay, I'll just um, add Please. one quick comment and just uh, pass it on to Supreet before. Um, the, at, a, at an institutional level, this is something, if we're looking at some good practices, uh, we actually have an innovation task force that's put together. Uh, whether the, the CTO is there, the head of research, the academic council, the media lab, they come together and their job is to constantly assess uh, what's the best uh, model for each of the electives and each of the areas and courses that we're looking to deliver. How do you go? What what can you do in terms of light on uh, bandwidth? What could you do that a student can actually download to watch later? How many hours that they require to be live? I think these are some important questions to put down on paper. And if uh, one is looking at a practice, a good practice model, this I think has has um, been to some extent working for us, and I think it's showing us a direction. Um, so I think if there's something I'd like to share as a good practice, uh, I'll put it out there without getting into details of how we actually deliver it. Thank you. Uh, I have two more questions and then we'll open to audience. Uh, this, uh, the next question is one of my, uh, you know, the favorite ones, because I think that, uh, you know, it has been mentioned multiple times that faculty, you know, I, I, and those of you who know the history of education know that the current system of K-12 and higher education uh, began in the industrial revolution for an entirely different reason. Uh, the, the, the people who ran the big factories and made a lot of money thought that they wanted to create a workforce that would work in factories and be very subservient and compliant. And therefore, we need the education systems to put people through that rigorous learning process of how to become compliant and subservient, right? So in many ways, uh, the chalk and talk model comes from that entire system, a chalk and talk lecture and then a lab. That whole uh, you know primitive model of learning and teaching has been with us for you know 300 years at this point. So the point is now that with the whole new model of uh, delivery that we just talked about in great detail, I think instructors, faculty, teachers, uh, this is a real issue because frankly, most of them would much rather dial back the clock. You know, those of you who read the book, uh, Who Moved My Cheese? They're in that group of uh, people who are saying that when is the cheese coming back to the same spot? But that's not going to come back to the same spot. And I think if I'm running an institution as an administrator, I have a big challenge. I can get my students to go digital in a heartbeat. But how do I get my faculty to accept the fact this is a new world and this is a better world if you know how to use it right, right? And there'll be experimentation, success, failures, trials and errors. But to take along people in their 40s and 50s who are the top dogs of the system, so to speak, you know, to me, it's not a technology problem alone. It's a psychology problem, too, we are trying to solve here, right? So I'd like your thoughts on what is the what are the best practices today that you're seeing in the limited time that all of us have seen this last six months that what kind of faculty training is effective in transforming people from the so-called old world that, you know, much as we all know, it's uh, shortcomings, people who defend it, defend it vociferously, right? So how do we get people to transform effectively? Are we just going to have 30-year-old professors take over and then displace the people who are at the top of this? Or do you think that everybody has a role to transform themselves and it's actually possible? I'll start with Supreet on this because I know Supreet, you're probably dealing with this directly. So, um... I'd like to give you a new angle to it. Um, there have been organizations today who are actually saying that, you know, hey, I don't really care uh, you, if you are a talent who can solve my problems, whether you're from a university, you hold a degree or not. That's the first uh, aspect of it. So which effectively boils down to the fact that, you know, do I really need to go to a university uh, and get a degree myself? Or do I go to a Coursera or an Adobe uh, learning uh, solutions and get a certification for myself, which, uh, you know, gives me that, uh, necessary visa and a passport to enter a uh, interview panel and then showcase my talent through various online talent uh, showcase portals in terms of uh, various things uh, that falls uh, you know if i were to just reflect back on some of these things uh, the the fundamental aspect of it you know in in a university will now uh, 
fall back to what got me here won't get you there uh, kind of a situation, right? So there is a necessity for professors, faculty members to act as mentors and no longer as, uh, you know, hey, I got a syllabus and a, you know, curriculum to cover um, and shift the gears towards practical applicability with the models of, you know, pre-learn, which you can do through various means. And today, you know, you can find everything in Google page 21, 22, 23, or even more, or even various online models that you have. And then switch over to areas of uh, how do you solve certain set of problems or address the different problems and different points of view and bring in the engagement within the classroom. So that would actually uh, bring in the participation and the learning curve would be much more steeper compared to what it traditionally has been around 20, 25% in, in an average university, or maybe it's a little higher in, in some of the top-notch university, which have been in the top ranking institutions in the hovering in the range of about 30, 35 degree when, when you look at the curve as well. Okay. All right. Uh, I think this is an uh, area that we don't have time to explore in great detail, but I'll ask my last question to uh, Shorya. Uh, Shorya, this is regarding this whole outcomes and uh, transformation and, and, and relevance to the job market, right? Do you think uh, in this new context of NEP as well as digital, do you think that as we get course credit flexibility as one of the elements that was talked about that, you know, a learner centric world where you can sort of create your own uh, sort of a boutique collection of courses that will give you what you want, which is kind of the US system in many ways for many years. Um, so do you think that a time has come for us to kind of move industry oriented strong courses into the curriculum through some kind of an agreement and adjustment? And uh, I'd like to get your comments on this whole idea of supplemental industrial curriculum inside the system. And you know, what do you think of that? And how well do you think that will be accepted? Yeah. And I think that's a very important point. And I think it's already happening, uh, you know, uh, Shantanu, because, uh, and I'll give you an example here. So, you know, uh, Coursera actually brings in content from top-notch universities, but we also bring in content from the likes of Amazon, Intel, you know, uh, uh, you know, deep learning dot AI, et cetera. So uh, the way, and, and I must congratulate the state of Telangana because they've also been one of the first movers in driving this blended learning. So JNTUH actually has partnered with uh, Coursera, for instance, for credit, uh, within their BTEC program. So they're offering about up to you know 20% credits through Coursera that they've uh, you know allowed for their BTEC programs. At the same time, they, they allow their students to take an additional 20 credits to build on a specialization and take an honors degree in BTEC. Uh, so some of this is actually useful because what we are trying to do with these students is that there is something being already taught in the classroom. And what content can we bring from these top-notch universities to supplement that curriculum? So if you're already studying marketing, can we bring in digital marketing as well? And that supplements it. Then apart from that, we can also complement the curriculum which is being taught in the class with job relevant skills, which could be coming through the industry content that a Facebook is developing or what a deep learning or AI is building. And those could be offered as electives to your students and built into the curriculum design itself. And lastly, there is this element of hands-on learning as well, because there is, uh, I mean, whatever job, whatever role you take, you will be working with a lot of software tools and a lot of applications. And that is expensive because you have to buy those licenses. You have to have uh, infrastructure to actually, you need to have a computer to install those machines, et cetera, et cetera. And what we're able to do is we're able to create those virtual environments where students can actually practice those specific software tools hands-on on a live data set, for instance. And all of this is already being built into the curriculum. And a lot of universities that we partner with are already on that path. Uh, so, so that's happening. And I can't emphasize the importance of this because uh, industry partnerships and industry, uh, the skills that the industry needs is constantly evolving. So uh, we need to keep pace with that as we go forward. And there's got to be a feedback loop as well as, uh, you know, uh, we need to build in content and take it back to our students for that model to be effective for your students. Great. Wonderful. That's well said. I will open up for questions to the audience now. Uh, we have about six, seven minutes left. So maybe two, three questions are in order. Are there any questions that uh, I can get on my um, back office updates? OK, I don't see any questions popping up at this point in time. So I will just continue to uh, you know, use the rest of the time here to finish up uh, well. And this is, I think, actually. Uh, an area where uh, you know I would revert to this whole point about uh, faculty and the role of faculty, right? We we touched upon it. My question fundamentally is, uh, oh, there we go. We get some questions now. Sorry, I'll step back and take a question. 
So with blended learning taking over and technologies like AI imparting learning, uh, will the role of uh, institutions become more monitoring, regulating, and certifying only? OK, that's an excellent question. So I'll just rephrase it for convenience. What I think all of you said in different ways is that content is no longer the primary responsibility of an instructor, because content is available from various sources, from experts digitally now, in a very, very uh, sort of significant amount of content is out there, which is good. So, uh, so going forward, the, will, will institutions be primarily in the game of regulating, monitoring curriculum and delivering the certificate? Because the content itself seems to be something that is becoming universal and the best practices are easily accessible to people. So what if I say that I, as an instructor, I'm putting together 10 YouTube videos for 10 sessions I teach, and those are 10 outstanding videos on related topics that gives me a whole experience of teaching. And all I'm doing as an instructor is really kind of helping you consume that content in an interesting way, right? Um, so the question is that, does it mean that universities can start to exit the content business itself? If I can take um, a stab at this, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, please, please, Supreet, go ahead. I can add. Uh, so I, I think uh, first things first is, uh, you know, one shoes does not fit all. That's the first point, which is effectively means that you cannot generalize content. Uh, you can add, and most important aspect of it is uh, you need to customize it to the lowest common denominator in your classroom. In, in, in this current world, uh, there is an effective uh, way to do it through technology as a means, uh, but it does not uh, mean that you know you can generalize content as an area. Is the role of an institution reduced to just monitoring, regulating, and certifying? And that's where traditionally has been the current system as well. And I don't think it is just uh, you know going back to the old uh, you know rule book of monitoring, regulating, and and which has been the role of majority of the state universities uh, for that matter. Uh, I think it, the role is quickly changing to the pedagogy approach, the way in which you need to relook at what are the learning outcomes of every single coursework that you're doing. Do you really need to have a three-year course or do you need to have a one-year degree in place? Or can you look at, uh, you know, uh, flipping the model of 80% theoretical, 20% practical to vice versa, 80% practical and 20% theoretical? Where do you need to bring in industry? Where do you need to bring in entrepreneurial experience? That is live experience uh, as an area. I'll just pause at that and I'll allow Kala to comment on this. So I'd like both of you, Kala and Shore, to comment on this because to me, this is actually a very important question that the role of the evolution of the faculty from a uh, primary source of content to a, a enabler of content and a facilitator to help you learn better, right? You become a student advocate rather than a student instructor. So uh, what do you think of this? Because I kind of have some empathy for this argument that you know, uh, we have to start mixing and matching content. In fact, the whole premise of Coursera is exactly that, you know, content can come from the best places and people can consume them anyway. So why should we say that my institution teaches electrical circuits better than your institution? What does that mean, right? Yeah. Let, me, um, let me circle back, and this is very interesting with the, uh, the Kriya's logo, if you see, it's, it's actually a crisscross logo at some point. And it's a very interesting analogy. You have these different strands Right. You, you need you need a tailor to stitch it together to bring it to a tapestry that's wearable. Now, the importance of that is never going to go away. And I think uh, the, the relevance maybe, you know, in terms of the teacher being more relevant and more relatable. Yes, that challenge is there. But the role itself, I don't think has is is going to disappear because that uh, that relationship in the in the space of uh, let me put it in the space of the young student learning. Now, I'm not talking about the adult learner. I'm not talking about the continuous learner for an adult learner or continuous learner. Technology can be a 100 percent tutor. But when you're actually talking about forming the mind of a young student, I think there is a relevance of the uh, the, the role of a teacher. Um, and, a uh, and a student relationship that cannot be ignored. You've got to bring the st uh, teacher up to speed in terms of how relevant they are and how relatable they are and how technology, they can, they can effectively use technology as an enabler and then stitch this pedagogy together with these various strands, right? Um, so simple things like ethics and how do you, how do you look at history and um, how do you apply a certain sense of reasoning is not something you're going to get online. And these are important as our students go into the workplace. Tomorrow, if the entire industry woke up and said, uh, come in, everybody with online degrees are going to get the top notch jobs and uh, they will you know, move up the scale much faster than uh, anybody who has come through a college network, then it'll change. But 
it, it doesn't. For now, those skills will continue to take you forward. I think if there is one place where any of this is going to replace, if, if I can kind of say replace, because blended means you, you're looking at both together. Um, maybe the investment in, like, say, uh, tomorrow, if we want to offer foreign languages to all our students, or we wanted to offer a, a suite of Indian languages. And those kind of things, I may not be employing teachers. I, may, I don't have to invest in a faculty of uh, department of languages. Those I can do online. And I think those level of um, ease of communication. So I, I think you, it's got to be a smart choice. I will um, not ignore the role of a tailor for a very long time. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I think, I think, uh, it, I mean, uh, the way I see it is that while content may become available, context is still very uh, sort of specific to the student and the learner. And I think one thing that you can't transmit digitally is motivation and inspiration. The relationship between, I mean, yeah. it's, learning yeah. is about 50% inspiration, right? It's not about content transmission. Anyway, so Shorya, I'll have you have the last word on this. Yeah. Of time. Yeah. Uh, please yeah, go yeah. ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll I'll quickly. So I think I see it more as a choice uh, uh, that the student will exercise. And, uh, you know, I, I don't believe uh, that the world will fully move online. And yet Coursera offers about 21 degrees, which are fully online, right? Uh, and there are different uh, trade-offs that the students and learners will make, actually. So if you can pay $100,000 to go and take up an MBA degree uh, for that particular university, you will do that. But if you can't, and maybe you're working professionally, you want to take it offline, you know, uh, while without quitting your job, you can actually go for an IMB at 25% of a cost from University of Illinois as well. And we have had that model in India. IGNU has been existing for a very long time, and yet there were universities which, which were thriving, right? Now, these universities will need to figure out what is the core value proposition they are offering, what is the benefit that they're offering to the students, and then the students will make that choice, what, what works for them in their respective context. And that's a very well said because it ties back to the idea of a learner centric universe um, and you know you, you are a primary sort of the world is designed around you as a learner and i think i'll end by saying that on a slightly more optimistic note that uh, while this disruption is very painful at some level it's also very exciting and uh, while it may be true that driverless cars are on the horizon the idea of a faculty-less institution is not on the horizon so with that we will end today and uh, thank you so much uh, supreet kala and shorya for participating really enjoyed this conversation and I hope the audience also got benefit out of this. So thank you so much to Fiki and the organizers for putting this together. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.